Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to Art in Real Time. I hope everybody got a chance to watch episode 40. Oh, lovely. I just made it worse. There we go. <laughs> Alcohol. You can see the alcohol evaporating off my lens. That's fun. I hope everybody got a chance to see episode 40 uh, from last week <clears throat> in which we made this beauty. All right. We showed everything in detail, how to do all of the things that are done here. We put this on. We put this on. I just did a quick live stream to add these two details for the members. But everything else you see, you can see in the video in episode 40. And we did an art in between episode where I did these two just a few minutes ago with the members. Um, but if you're not familiar with <clears throat> art in real time, that is where I make art in real time. Uh, it's mostly miniatures that we do here, although I do plan on doing other things down the road. But uh, we do art in real time so you can see how long things actually take to make. Some are a reality check and some are very reassuring. So hopefully you'll stick around and you'll enjoy this video. In this video, we are going to make a base for this diorama. We're going to do the sidewalk. I'll show you exactly how to sculpt that and do a little bit of a, a fake street in front. I'll show you guys how to do that as well. Maybe, just maybe, we'll add a couple of other things here at the end. Um, I'm going to show you how to use a tool you've probably never seen me use before. This is a 45 Colt Winchester bullet shell casing. I'm going to show you exactly how to use this in a diorama. So stay tuned for that. And we've got our helpers with us today that I had helping us last week. We have Bricky, Mason, and Red, right? Bricky's always ready to go. Mason's never sure what's going on. And Red, he's just happy to happy to be happy to be acknowledged. These are some of the tools I'm gonna to use in this video. We're gonna to use toothpicks. You'll see what that's for later. And we're gonna use two-part epoxy. We'll see, I'll show you what that's for later. That's actually gonna go with our bullet shell. We're gonna use these rulers. I went over in detail last week. I'm probably just gonna be using the 12 inch ruler. I don't think I'm gonna need a larger ruler for this because everything we're doing is 12 inches or smaller. We're gonna be using some masking tape that goes with the bullet shell later. And we're gonna be using bent needle nose pliers also with the bullet shell later. And extendable box cutters and exactos. Most of these tools can be found below in links uh, below if you need to order some online or you can find these at your local Home Depot or craft store. I love extendable box cutters. They're so versatile, but don't cut yourself. Be careful, please, please, please be careful. All right, so we have got this piece of foam. This is what we started with last week. It is a 12 inch by 12 inch piece of Owens Corning insulation foam. Again, link below if you want this exact size, or you can go to Home Depot and get their one inch thick or two inch thick pieces uh, in two foot by two foot or four foot by eight foot. Lowe's has the blue stuff as well. Um, and um, we need to make a base for this. So what we're gonna do, hold this red. What we're gonna, ah, stay there, okay. So I've got two more pieces of this half inch thick foam just because it's convenient, it's already cut down. Um, I do have a video on how to cut this foam down. It's entitled, How to Cut Pink Foam. If you wanna go watch that, I think it's got over 10,000 views in my specific, skill, specific skills playlist. I show you exactly how to cut down a larger piece of foam using a box cutter and a metal T-square. Uh, you could use a you could just use a piece of wood if you wanted to as long as it's straight. So if you need to see how to take a bigger piece of foam and break it down to get smaller pieces like this, go check out that video. But I'm starting with these just for convenience and time. Something to note about all these foam pieces, you see how when I sandwich these two together, this curves up a little bit and there's like a warp there. It seems to be unavoidable from Owens Corning. I don't know what it is when it comes out of like the press or the roller after it's expanded and heated. There's always like a little curl up. I imagine it's going through like a roller and then it just kind of like goes bloop and plops back down and then like cures like that. So just be aware when you're placing this, especially for a base, that you place this strategically because as you can see as I push here, it bounces up a little bit. That's because it curls up this last like two inches. So what I might do is I either will cut this off, sand this down or use this as the front so the back is nice and flat, you know, or use this as the back to hide it. Just kind of depends on what you want to do. So what's up, Troy Dodson, member for 21 months, says hello there. Hello there. Um, 
And then I'm gonna use this other piece to cut the sidewalk, to lay on that, and we're gonna kind of stack things up. All right, so what I, the first thing I wanna do to make a base is I'm gonna line this up with the back, and again, I have to kind of make a call here. I'm gonna go ahead and do it on the non-curved upside, and I'm gonna plop this right here so it's lined up nice. Loki war tooth, this is why you buy the larger ones. The larger ones have that curl too, it's unavoidable. But you can start with a bigger piece um, uh, and cut it down to size if you need to make a smaller dial, but you're still gonna have the same problem on a big dial. So I'm just gonna trace where my footprint is here. Make sure that's nice and level. Yep, now I know where to place my sidewalk. And we have this tall piece here. Um, you can, there's two ways you could do this. You could set this on top of your sidewalk or you could abut your sidewalk to it. Let me show you what I mean here. So if you were to place this on the back, like I just traced, I'm gonna butt your sidewalk. That's how much your little leading edge would shrink down, which I kind of like that look, so I'm probably gonna keep that. Or let me see, maybe I'll change my mind. If I lay my sidewalk on top and then abut this on top, that's how tall our base would be, which would make the height of this, the 12 inches to the back foam, and then one inch, so we actually have a 13 inch tall diorama, because half inch, half inch plus a half inch plus the height of that would get to it, get us to 13 inches. In this case, we'd be at 12 and a half inches, right? So if you wanted to make it exactly 12 by 12 by 12, you'd have to cut a half inch off of this back piece to a butt, or you'd have to line it up from the back and then cut off a half inch or whatever the depth of your back piece is, which in this case would be like three quarters of an inch to make it 12. So just keep that in mind when you're planning for space, account for slapping things on top or abutting things to the bag or whatever you have to do if you're trying to fit it into a specific space. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the abutment method like this. It's also a little stronger. So see how on this back corner here, if I do this uh, like that, that's gonna have three intersecting pieces to create an L shape. Everything's gonna hold together a little bit tighter. And when I use these smaller magnets, I'm actually gonna use these smaller half inch magnets instead of the big three quarter inch or one inch ones most people are used to, or seven eighths of an inch, depending on the size. I'm gonna use the half inch ones and this will allow me to do a little bit more detailed placement. You'll see what I mean. So what I have to decide now is how deep I want my sidewalk. And as a general rule for <clears throat> sort of like residential sidewalks, you're gonna get about a four foot wide sidewalk. So four feet or a little, uh, you know, or like a meter and a third of a meter, whatever that is in metric or for all of you folks that use meters, a little over a meter. Um, for here, it's four feet or 48 inches um, for the actual sidewalk dimension. So if we went four inches, we'd be right about there. So if I'm doing a smaller diorama on this, what I wanna know is how much street do I want? How much sidewalk do I want? Do I want most of my most of my figures, if I'm gonna display figures, standing on the sidewalk or, or street? Or do I wanna just go all street and have it be like a back alley where there's no sidewalk or there's a tiny sidewalk? Sometimes you have those like 18 inch wide sidewalks that you can just walk next to like a truck. If there's a truck backed up, you could do that. I've done those as well. So this is where you gotta kind of make your own personal choice here. We're just gonna talk about the basic sculpting and layering and how to stack things together. But that is the gist of what we're doing. I am going to make a judgment call here. You can see where the four inch mark is here down on the bottom. Let me uh, tilt my camera down here for you guys. So if we go with a four inch sidewalk um, with a half inch curb, which is about right in one twelfth scale, you would end up with, um, you know, you'd end up with a, like almost an eight inch street. So that's enough room to put like a motorcycle. I'm gonna go with a five inch sidewalk just to make a bigger sidewalk. So I'm gonna go five inches on the sidewalk. So again, in one twelfth scale, an inch equals a foot. So if I want it to be five feet, I just go five inches. That's why one twelfth scale and an imperial ruler divided by 12 is very helpful. So this is my base, this is my sidewalk, and I'm gonna go ahead and line this up on my cutting mat for the sake of ease here, and measure over the lab plane flying over. 
I'm at the 14 inch mark here. I'm gonna go over to the 19 inch mark. And let me sneak you guys over here. Bam. Line it up on the 19 inch here. And this is surprisingly easy. Whoops. Here's a little demo on how to cut the pink foam. I usually use a larger box cutter when I'm doing a long cut in a deep piece of foam. As perpendicular as I can get it, do one cut, two cuts, make sure it's not tilting one way or the other, one more cut, and then I can take this away. And you see how straight that is here in the edge there, right there. I can trust my cuts as my guide now and Voila, save this for future builds. And here's the beginning of my sidewalk. Now, a little trick I kind of showed last week. There's my cut edge, I can use that. It kind of looks, I don't know why my camera is not really wanting to focus as much right now. But there's my little cut edge. It's got a rough texture on it. You can utilize that texture as a concrete texture. If you flip it around though, you get the factory edge that has a nice hardened texture. That also looks nice. Both look like troweled and dried concrete. Um, so that's a little trick. You can use the already pre-textured edge, uh, whichever one you like to your advantage to simulate some hyper real texture because this actually looks quite nice uh, as a concrete texture or even a brick texture or a, a cornice tile or, or a, um, I don't know why I can't think of the term, but the corbels, corbel, corbel texture, the, the high up brick detail you see on the top of a building edge. This stuff already looks quite nice for that. I've utilized that many times. So most curbs, you're looking at around uh, four to six inches for a curb. I usually just go around a half inch uh, for my curbs roughly. But if you want to go hyper, hyper real, you'd want to shrink it a little bit less because most curbs are right around four inches. Um, but I do feel like the four inch curb in 112 scale almost looks too small. So that's why I go to the half inch mark. So I'm lining it up one half inch in using my cutting mat. Again, a very uh, wonderful advantage to have a nice cutting mat. I'm gonna switch to my smaller knife and I don't wanna cut all the way through here. I just wanna create a depression. that's about a quarter of an inch in like that. See that? And now I wanna decide on my spacing. So since this is now four and a half inches uh, depth, cause I went a half inch back from my five inch width um, if I want to kind of emulate how concrete's normally laid, it's usually split up into squares. Obviously, this is not going to be perfectly divisible by four and a half inches because it's 12 inches wide. So I can't have like three perfect squares. So I want to decide do I want to have a perfect square, a perfect square, and then an offset, or a perfect square in the middle and two offsets, right? Meaning the two outside divisions of concrete are slightly smaller. Do I want to center my piece or do I want to off-center it? Or do I want to start? That's entirely up to you visually. I'm going to off center it a little bit so that I have a small one, a big one, a big one, and then a super small one. I think that's going to be more visually interesting. I try to go for things that are offset. They talk about making thumbnails for YouTube sometimes and using the rule of thirds where instead of centering in it as something right in the image, um, uh, you kind of off center it to the left or to the right. So it's on the, the division, the, the third of the the third split where you split split you get three divisions on that line you place your image it's a little bit more visually appealing works in uh, film as well as far as placement inside of a frame so i do that a lot of times in my diorama uh, i'll place things a little off center which is exactly why i place this off center if it was in the center it actually might not be as visually interesting but because i split this into thirds and my this is the center line of my third here is on that center line it looks a little bit more interesting, right? It looks a little bit more natural, a little bit more real. And if I decided to place a figure here, he would not hide the features. And if I had this right in the center and I put the figure, it would look like it was framing the figure almost like a, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't look like he was naturally in the environment. It might look a little too intentional, which is maybe what you want to go for. But that's not what I'm trying to do here. We're going for that hyper reality, which is really just trying to make it look real. Hyper real is kind of a misnomer, but... Um, just gonna line this up again on my cutting mat. And then I'm going to pick an interval here, maybe two inches in. Yep, and then I'm gonna start on, I don't wanna start 
Well, yeah, I'm gonna start all the way to the edge and drag it through. Then I'm gonna go four and a half over. I'm gonna go ahead and mark it, which is right there. Lining it up, drag that. And then four and a half over again, puts me on this one. Right here. All right, so you see how that got divided up? It's a little bit, it's not, it's not, these two aren't centered, it's not centered, it's not in the middle and split, it's kind of just staggered. Again, I feel like I just, it feels like a slice out of reality. You know, like I just stole a chunk right out of reality. I'm gonna carry the line over here. Like that. And then I'm just gonna kind of reassemble it to make sure I'm happy with what I did. And this will be the point to do that in case you don't, maybe you don't like the way you divided that up. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you think it looks stupid and Oilers is an idiot. Plenty of people do. Okay, so that is how it's divided up. There's a little bit of a taper in my cutback here I didn't notice, so I'm gonna trim that up. Actually, I'll probably just sand that off. Um, yeah, so my cut ended up straight on this side, but it ended up tapered on this side. So I'm just going to get some rubber sanding block with 120 grit sandpaper on it and clean that up. There's our straight side that we cut, and now this side is a lot more straight. Still gonna need some work. Don't be afraid to get the 80 grid out too. If it's uh, on a side that's not gonna be visible. Let me just test it here. That's better, a little closer. Yep. So the seam is a lot tighter. There's still a little seam there. You can see there's some wibble wobble, but you can go in there and fill it in with dirt or little pieces of grass at the end uh, to, you know, to make it look natural. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get my 80 grit sandpaper. probably should change out the sheet. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this to round over this front edge. Now, go outside and look at concrete in your neighborhood or your city. We've got a sharp top corner here. Most concrete is not done that way. It's usually slightly rounded, if not very rounded. I'm gonna go a little bit more rounded on this just for the sake of demonstration. And I'm gonna use the piece I cut off of this um, as a, a, a riser and then sand this down with the 80 grit. And I'm going to sand it at 45, and then I'm going to roll it back and forth to get the shape that I want. And then I'll refine it as I go. Let me see if I can get you guys a good angle here. There is the rounded edge of the concrete. And I just did exactly what I said. And then we're gonna do the same thing we did last week. I'm just gonna use a pencil this time and we're going to trace our lines like we did the brick. And I'm gonna push a little bit harder so we get a little bit of a deeper deeper angle going in and I don't mind these cracks in the foam because that just looks like cracks in the concrete. And there you go. So you could weather the heck out of this if you want, but this is like basic sort of newly laid concrete. 
What I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna add some trowel, trowel marks and texture to this. Again, with the 80 grit sandpaper, a lot of times, well, I say trowel marks, it's actually broom marks, but when they, they go in and they lay the concrete um, and then they'll come back with a broom, like a big push broom, and then drag it across to create some sort of vertical um, scraping in the concrete so that number one, it provides a little bit of attraction. And if it's like ice is over and melts, it helps get some traction because then you have some like, uh, some variation in the grade because there's lines in there. It also helps with drainage. Uh, it makes it look interesting and it's not just flat boring concrete like you'd see like in a convention center. Usually they do this on the exterior. So I'm gonna go like this and I'm gonna just drag some straight lines. I'm gonna keep it, I don't wanna curve it or go at an angle, I wanna go straight. So I'm just gonna do like that. I'm gonna do it a couple of times. It might be hard to see on camera, but it has provided a little bit of texture. And then I'm going to take my box cutter and cut some breaks into this where you would naturally see them. Like that. Just a few, nothing crazy. And then if you want to, you can take an X-Acto knife and you can, I like what I like to do when I drag my pencil through and I get these little cracks like there, I like to take that crack and, and, and extend it out. So let me change angles again, my camera's not wanting to focus as well. Okay, I'm grab this crack. Don't step on a crack or you're falling back to back. Blur, 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 blur. Okay. Right here. See what I did? I jerked it back and forth. Instead of making this smooth line, I kind of jerk, drag, jerk, drag. And then what I create is these little divots like that. I'm going to take that divot and carry that one out. And then you can take that divot. It's a very natural looking crack. And then usually at the point of the point of beginning of the stress is where you get a lot more cracking. So I'm just gonna come in here and add some more cracking around here. Might even tear a few little pieces out to create some divots. And then you're gonna, of course, get some crack. There you go. Maybe I'll do another little one right here. I'm gonna wiggle, for a finer crack, I wiggle it back and forth like this until I get to the edge I want to make it look like it just split a little bit. I'm gonna carry that around here too. There's little tiny details that make a big difference. See like this little drag mark here? I love that. It looks like a natural weathering in the concrete. You'll do a little bit of a carry this one around. Perfect. What's up, Sanch TV? Who's here? I haven't said hi to anybody yet. <laughs> 25 minutes in. Troy Dodson, what is up? What is up? What is up? What is up? Okay. Hello, everybody. All right. <clears throat> I think I've said hi. Everybody's quietly watching. Thank you guys for the 29 likes, Scott, by the way. I really appreciate that. 
do a couple more little crackaroonies. It's a technical term, crackaroonie. That's good. I don't want to overdo it. I tend to over, it's easy to really overdo it, but I think that's that's good, just like that. So it looks like a lot too when it's pink, but when you paint it all gray, uh, it'll end up looking, should end up looking pretty nice. So just lift that up. And again, we're just gonna check what it looks like against our piece here. Beep, just like that. And of course you could paint your curb different colors. You could cut this out and put a drain here. You know, you could do all kinds of creative things. You could put a drain back here, you know, you could get creative like that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use, I forgot to mention the sewing needle pins at the beginning. Sewing needle pins. Sewing pins. Not really sewing needle pins there. Of course, needles and pins are the same thing. I'm just gonna use this to hold my back wall in place while I place this and glue it. <clears throat> so I'm just going to get this lined up perfectly how I want it. Like that. And of course, doesn't want to stay, we'll put some weight on it. Okay, like that. I'm gonna put a couple of pins in this. Make sure this is right where I want it. Pin it in place. Okay, now that that is pinned in place, I'm gonna go ahead and glue this down. And I'm gonna use EPS glue. There's a link below if you guys want to get some Bob. I think there's a link below for it. Uh, Bob Smith Industries EPS glue. This is just a bigger bottle from Hotwire Foam Factory, but it's the exact same glue. And I'm going to. I love this stuff because it dries quick. It gets tacky quick, and you can peel it off pretty easily before it's cured if you need to. But it keeps everything in place. And I don't need a lot of glue for this. Um, you can, sometimes I take the cap off and use the whole bottle like it's a glue stick, but we don't need to go too crazy with this. I don't like hot glue gluing foam to foam because hot glue is not really glue. It's melted plastic. It doesn't actually bond. It just sort of heat sticks. And if you put a diorama in an environment that changes temperature a lot where it gets hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, that hot glue will eventually unstick itself. Um, I've actually had that happen before. Hot glue is not the most reliable for every project. It works great for other things, but not for this. So I'm just going to place this. Yes, fat red foo is correct. Hot glue is the devil. And I'm just going to I'm going to kind of push this and mash it down so that glue sp spreads out and squishes, which will help it stay in place. Beep. Just like that. That's going to go up. Okay, let me make sure it's actually placed correctly. We have five and three quarters. And we have five and... Oops, five and a little over three quarters. So this back piece that I cut here must be, this piece on here must be slightly uneven. That's okay though. I don't really care. Sixteenth of an inch is not going to be the end of the world. So we're going to set this aside and we're going to cut a 12 inch by five and three quarters piece of street. That is what this rolled cork is for. I'll put a link below if there isn't one for rolled cork. If you're watching the future times, you should be able to get some. This is cork board that you can get in rolls. You can even pick this up at Office Depot if you don't want to order it, but I think it is cheaper on my link and on Amazon. Last time I checked, Office Depot charges like, I think it's like two to five bucks more. Um, so, but I don't know if that's changed. So check for yourself. But I don't think this is 12 inches wide. Nope. So I'm going to lay this down in this direction. Again, I'm going to utilize my lovely cutting mat and line 
this edge up on my line here. And find 12 inches, which will be right here. And cut this off. Make sure you're using a sharp knife when you cut cork, otherwise it will just tear the edge. Won't look good. <clears throat> With cork too, you can just roll it back the other way kind of roll it up and just kind of work it out like dough and it should sit a little flatter. Might have to do it a couple of times. Don't want to roll it too tight though because it will just crack. Do, 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 do. Massaging cork. Okay, that's flat enough for me. Oh, I, maybe I will. No, that's good. I was thinking I might need my bigger ruler, but I guess I don't. And line this back up on my cutting mat here. Of course, if you don't have a cutting mat, you can get a ruler and you can just mark all your dimensions. Of course, it's more steps, it takes more time, but you can do it that way, it works totally fine. Going to the five and three quarters here. Five and three quarters. I'm actually gonna use my smaller knife, it's a little sharper. And we're gonna go like this. Don't cut yourself. Be careful. Oops. There we go. Cut that little wonky there at the end, but that's okay. Save this for other dioramas. And back to this. So, oh, whoops, I cut that a little wider than 12 inches. I'm not sure how I did that, but I did it. That's okay. So I'm going to just hold this. What's up, mini moderns? Um, let me just mark where I need to cut this off here. 34 people watching and 34 likes. Thank you guys. Appreciate that very much. All right. So here is me just using the diorama to measure it without actually using the cutting mat can be very helpful sometimes. I'm doing good. How are you? How's everybody in the chat tonight? Hope everybody is doing well. End of the year. I have to pay taxes soon. Yay! All right. That is our street. So, if you've never done miniature street before, I do have a whole live stream just talking about the street in more detail. But the reason we go with cork, and you can do this with other materials. There is spreadable material that's got texture in it where you can spread it out with a knife. That gets a little bit more undulation and unevenness, which looks like a really worn down, like driven on street, which is a nice look. You can also use sandpaper. So if you get yourself some like 60 grit sandpaper and you can glue that down, you can get, it's a finer look, but it also looks like street. There's, if you go out and you look closely at the street that's laid in your city, You'll see a lot of different variations in texture depending on how it was laid, if it was just a top layer, if it's new, if it's old, if it's been driven on a lot, if lots of heavy vehicles are on it, all of that type of stuff. So you, this is just to get the basic, clean, fresh street in. And you can actually weather this cork to look more detailed if you want. You can scrape it, you can dig at it. I'm gonna show you a little quick thing that I do uh, where I like to actually you can do this if you want. You can draw on it and determine a, a placement. I'm just going to do it at random, though, where I'm going to take this and I'm just going to going to tear it like that. And now we have a torn edge like this, but this edge, as you can see, it overlaps that edge. They look identical like that. But I'm going to take this and I'm going to just take... Um, uh, I'll use my big knife. And I'm going to just... Scrape away, you can see what I'm doing here. Scrape away this top edge so that it matches this edge when I abut them. Because what I did was when I broke it, this top edge broke away when I peeled up. The top edge broke away from the bottom and I want them to both look like this, like they've been worn down equally. So I'm just gonna go like this. See, and now it doesn't have like a, an overbite. 
they both got a matching underbite which is that's just me being like sort of OCD about the hyper realness of it all let me grab a brush okay Clean up my cork mess. Okay, so here is my two pieces of street, and when I abut them, I have a nice natural-looking break in my street that looks like it's been worn. Now you can come back in after you glue this down and fill that in with putty or like a black caulking to look like tar that's been laid down. Whatever you want to do. So I'm going to glue this down with EPS glue. I highly recommend EPS glue for this, especially if you're going to paint with water-based acrylics um, and cork, it soaks up water. So if you use like PVA glue or tacky glue, um, another reason I don't really like using tacky glue or PVA glue that much is it's water-based and cork will soak it up and it'll want to warp. Um, but if you use a spray glue that doesn't melt foam like Gorilla Glue, or you use two-part epoxy that does not melt foam, or you use clear EPS glue that does not melt foam, uh, it will stick fine and won't warp up. And then when you, another thing is if you do get, you do lay down PVA glue or white glue and you glue this down and you hold it down and let it dry so it doesn't bubble up. And then you take this off, take the thing weighting it down off and then you paint it with acrylic paint. The acrylic, water-based acrylic will wet the cork and go through and re-wet the glue and then it will bubble up. I've done it. Uh, it's annoying and it's like really frustrating after you've done all that work. So I like to use a non-water-based glue that does not melt foam. EPS glue sprayable urethane foam uh, or epoxy. Uh, they all work just fine and they don't melt the foam. I will show you the Gorilla Glue. This Gorilla Glue does not melt foam. There also is a glue called 303 spray adhesive you can order that does not melt foam and it works even, it's even stronger than Gorilla Glue. And I believe Super 77 does not melt foam either. I don't use that that often. I know a lot of people in the special effects industry like to use Super 77 because they can create other effects with that spray glue. But I have found that Super 77 runs out in the can way faster and it's more expensive. So I don't actually like using Super 77 as an adhesive that much because I run out of it really fast and the, it seemed the, the tip gets clogged up more. So Gorilla Glue and 303 seem to work better on foam for me and the bottle and the tip last a lot longer. So. Just a pro tip there. Okay, so I'm gonna take the top off my glue here. Yeah. And I'm gonna use this like a glue stick, like I said. And spread my glue like that. And this way I can get a really dense, even layer. Oops. Of course, I get it all over my cutting mat like an idiot. And hold on a second, let me clean that up. I keep little scraps of cardboard around just to do stuff like this. Spread my EPS glue. And you actually have to work pretty quick with this. The thinner you spread it, the faster it cures. Interestingly enough, another reason I like it, it adapts to working conditions. So. It's the best glue for foam. Don't let anybody tell you different, because they will be wrong. And I will stand by that. Uh, I'm going to clean that up after the stream. Okay. So, I'm going to press this down. And this is where you really want to make sure it's pressed down evenly. Because if you, if you, this glue is, it can trap air bubbles and as it off gases, as the glue actually cures, it will let vapor out. And if you don't press whatever item you're pushing down, especially like this malleable item evenly, as you, as you roll it down like this, it can trap a little bubble of air. And then after, as it off gases, the vapor can get trapped in there. And then you'll come back like the next day and you'll see a little bubble of cork sticking up. You have to pop it and then re-glue it down, which I, it does happen. It's not the end of the world. It's just very annoying to have to do. So we're going in here, pressing this in place. And I'm kind of picking it up, pushing it back down too, to help with that, just to make sure 
everything is in place. There we go. So remember that piece that I cut off of this piece? I'm gonna put this on top of the cork and I'm going to use this really heavy piece of metal or uh, ballast that I have. You can use anything you want, piece of wood. And I'm gonna use that to weigh it down while it cures so that if any of those vapor bubbles happen, they get pushed out uh, and it dries evenly and doesn't wanna curl at all. Cause this glue, the glue will wanna curl a little bit, um, especially around the edges. If you just leave the edge exposed without any weight on it, the edge will curl up a little bit, so. All right, we're gonna take this off now that that's placed. Moving kind of fast on this stream because I wanted to get to this super secret special bullet tool. All right, so everything is gluing. This is in place. This is, so you can see, this is, it's dried enough to where I can budget if I push really hard, but it'll stay in place for the most part. So I could glue this down and make this permanent or I could magnetize this. Let me see what the chat's saying here. Hold on one sec, guys. Cool. Everybody that's here seems to have a lot of great suggestions. Thank you for sharing those in the chat. Okay. So we're going to use... These ceramic mini magnets, I love these. I get these at Home Depot. You can order them online. Magnet source magnets. These are the half inch ones. Now, obviously these are smaller, so they're less strong. So you might need to use more, but since we're using half inch thick foam, I can't use the big seven eighth inch ones I use on the one inch foam. So I'm gonna do three. And the reason I have the, I have this edge here, I could do one forward facing. Um, because this isn't aligning perfectly with this, I probably won't do a forward facing one. Actually, I just realized why it's not aligning because that's at an angle. That's fine. Um, so I'm just going to do three down. But this is the magnets. And you need twice as many magnets as you're going to place uh, placements. So I have one, two, three placements. So I need six magnets. One, two, three, four, five, six magnets is all I should need for this. It should be fine with, with six. It's a small piece. <clears throat> And this is mostly for like storage or shipping. If I were gonna make this for somebody uh, or I wanted to make it so I could store it and collapsible, I can take this off and flatten it down instead of having this big uh, one foot cubic diorama that I can't put anywhere. I can make it into a, a one foot square and only three inches up diorama, you know what I mean? So this is the half inch magnet and that is what my bullet shell is for. This is a 45 caliber Winchester bullet shell. If you don't have any bullet shells and you want to try this, I like this because it's metal and it's thin ed, thin walled. You can find a piece of pipe or a piece of um, copper pipe that's half inch. They sell that at Home Depot. Wall's a little thicker, so it's a little harder to cut through this with a with a thicker wall. But if you have an ammunition shop in town that's got spare uh, cartridges or casings, you can go over there and be like, hey, do you have a 45 caliber or one that's about a half an inch? Like that. See that? That is exactly the same as the magnet. So I can do this a few ways. I can measure it or I can just place them where I want. I can do a lot of different things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place them where I want them on the base first and then transfer that to the back wall. So I'm just going to kind of use this as a guide and I'm going to go maybe an inch and a half in, in the center and an inch and a half in like that. That's all I'm going to do. And then I'm going to take this bullet casing and I'm going to press it where I want it. See that there's a little divot there now. I'm actually going to take that divot and I'm just going to heat it up. Look at that. Do the same thing here. Press it, make sure it's where I want it. And I'm going to go back and forth and it's going to heat up the foam and let me cut into it. If you push too hard or too fast, it'll just depress the foam. We don't want to do that. You want to uh, heat it up. So just go back and forth and let it heat up and cut into the foam with some heat. And then this is where our bent needle nose pliers come in. I'm just going to tear it out. 
That one didn't cut as well, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter. That there's a little bit of gnarliness inside the hole. Same thing here. Just so you guys know, I actually don't own any guns. I just got these for when I was doing steampunk art. I got a lot of bullet casings at um, at, a, at um, a local ammunition shop. I went in and I just asked if I could buy them by the pound. So I got like 20 pounds of brass and nickel coated uh, brass casings to make steampunk art and things out of. So that's why I have these. I actually don't. I've been shooting with my roommates before, but I don't, I don't own guns or do, any, do anything with guns. Except make art out of steampunk stuff. Or for steampunk stuff. Just in case any of you were wondering. And you start dropping like gun knowledge in the chat. I don't I don't know anything. <laughs> I know that's what this is because that's what it says on the back. So I did have a roommate. Um, I think I told the story before. But I did have a roommate whose dad had a huge collection of, of guns. And we went to a shooting range. And he had a left-handed and a right-handed and a right-handed 50 cal rifle. I got to shoot the uh, right-handed 50 cal rifle, and I was the only one that day, and it was my second time ever going to shoot a gun, um, I actually shot a television screen they set up at the end of the shooting range. I, I don't remember how far I was out there, but I was the only one, and I was like, really? Uh, aren't you guys supposed to be better at this? <laughs> that was my only other, my last experience uh, shooting anything. So. so you see this little magnet here? I will use another magnet to place it. See that? Boom. This is what the epoxy is for. Epoxy does not melt foam, and that is what the toothpicks are for, is mixing the epoxy. Bloop. So, we're gonna use the hardener, well, the resin part, doesn't really matter which part we use. And I'm going to use one drop of resin in each hole. Or maybe like one and a half drops. The camera's going out of focus a lot, guys. Sorry. Okay, that's that one. You just want to do equal parts of hardener and resin. So that's the resin. Resin. Here is the epoxy hardener. And then this stuff works quick. It's five minute epoxy. I love using it for magnets though, because I can keep moving on the diorama. I, I get impatient and I like to keep working. I don't like sitting around waiting for stuff to dry. And if I do, I usually have two things going at once. Come on. Sometimes the hardener is a little thicker. Uh, equal amount of hardener. Okay, now we're just going to mix it up in the hole with toothpick. You can use it with a brush, you don't mind wasting. I'm just using a toothpick because obviously I can throw it away. Like that. That should be good. Mix this one up. Gooey, 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 this is going to get thrown away. But, so now I take my magnets and I'm gonna, or there, there we are. And I'm gonna pair them up so that they're magnetically two by two. And I'm gonna go like this and I'm gonna push one in and slide that off and set that up there. And then I'm going to push one in, slide that off and set that there. 
push one in, slide that off and set that there. Oops, that one magneted itself to it. And then, this is where the tape comes in. So, the cool thing about painter's tape is it doesn't stick to epoxy glue. So you can go like this, put painter's tape down. Masking tape. I don't know about the white masking tape, but I know the blue and the frog tape, the yellow and the green frog tape, uh, masking tapes. <coughs> don't stick to the epoxy. So then I can go like this, plop those all down. And here is the cool trick for the day. Get you guys a cool angle here. You see these three <coughs> magnets? Now that they're placed where they're, they're going to go, I'm going to take this and I'm going to line it up and press it onto the magnets. And then I can see exactly where I need to pop the holes for these magnets. So now I know where these need to go because there's little depressions in the foam from the magnets. So one is right here. One is right, see that right there? One is right here. And one is right there. And then it's just the same process. Of tearing out the foam. Sometimes you end up tearing too much foam out, meaning you create a hole that's way too deep for the magnet. Just put some of your little tear outs back in there. Meaning like, see, like this hole is a little deep. You can just take some of your little tear outs and just shove them back in there when you put the epoxy in there. And that'll help. It's really all you need to do. The epoxy is very strong. Check and make sure those all ended up in the right place. And push it down. Yep. We're good. So now I can follow that same exact procedure. Take that off. Take that off. Shoop a doo doop a doo. Get another toothpick. And do the same thing. Here, I'm going to have to do this, this really quick. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You could take these bottles and put them in a cup of warm water to make the resin and hardener flow better, but it will, because it is an exothermic reaction and the resin heats up and that's how it cures, if you have them warmer than room temperature, they will cure faster. So just so you know, you don't, you won't have as much time to mix it. And then we, Take our toothpick and mix it up the same way. Do 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 Almost there. Okay, and then I just want to make sure, bring you guys back down here, I keep all of my magnets aligned with where they're supposed to go. So I leave these on here until I'm ready to put them in here. So I know to flip this up into there so that the poles and the magnets align when I actually depress them into each other again.
Okay. You probably want to use gloves, by the way. Uh, if you're not used to this, I'm pretty used to it. So I know what to do to not get glue on my fingers, but then you grab some more tape, put it on this side, and make sure it's flat. And then put it right back on. Ta-da! And now you can have the mag the diorama magneted together while the glue's drying. Giving you guys some major Oilers Workshop super quick secret ultra magical amazing tips today and yesterday. Well, last week, not yesterday. You know what I mean. Okay. So that is not going anywhere. And you see that's how strong it's going to be when it's all the glue's dry. So you know that you can move this back and forth and nothing's not going to fall apart. Right. Hold on one sec. Let me just put some things away before we continue here. That was my red face. And I realize what you said, Fat Red Foo. You, the brick is not modeled after you, Fat Red Foo. His name is just Red. So don't take offense to Red. Red is my friend. I just, you know. I had an idea to create some kooky characters. Okay. Stay there. Glue. Whoops. Get over here before I break it. Okay. Sandpaper. That was a dumb. Scrap cork drawer and paper. Uh, I haven't had any caffeine in a while, but I seem to be pretty energetic right now. do to me. Tape. Roller stays over here. Needles. Bullet. Toothpicks. Brush. Pencil. Actually, I have a preview for the next stream. Let me uh, clean up my table. Rosebad one, so is this your full-time job or a side hustle? I guess it technically qualifies as a side hustle, but I'm trying to turn it into my full-time job because you guys are awesome and I love doing this. So we're on our way, we're on our way. It's becoming a significant, and well, a not insignificant portion of my income. So I'm trying to make it all of my income so that I can do this not just once every other week or once every week, but like twice a week, you know? So we're on our way. <clears throat> Time to and I put the tool away that I need, of course. Get some denatured alcohol here and clean off the glue I spilled before it completely cures. Ta-da! The magic of fuel. Yep, 
Yeah, Fat Red Food did a deep dive, man. He went down the rabbit hole of Oilers Workshop. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look at how this turned out. Let's see what our audience thinks here. So I'm gonna leave this on here overnight though. I'm gonna take it off just to talk, just to show it. Take that off. So that is our street, our sidewalk, our back wall. Pretty, pretty swell little diorama. If I don't say so myself, and I do. <clears throat> What street urban diorama wouldn't be complete with an alien from Star Wars named Greedo? And a completely out of scale C-3PO. Perfect. Some TV style here. Okay. So this is the diorama that we made in about two hours. We didn't paint it, but we sculpted it in about two hours. We had the painting and the weathering and the finishing and adding even more details like conduit and wires, which I thought about doing, but I think I'm gonna leave this because the next step we're gonna do in this diorama, we're gonna to wanna to be able to take away. We wanna be able to subtract. So with painting and finishing and adding details, you're probably looking at, you know, you could be pushing 10 hours depending on how far you get into it, but you can definitely do something really, really nice like this. Uh, once you've had the practice down to do all these things as quickly as I'm doing them or even faster, which I'm sure some of you will get there if you're not already there. Um, you can do something nice like this in about eight hours, something really nice. But it still takes eight hours. The sculpting part I've gotten down, which is the longest part when I was new to this. But the, um, the painting part is just as long, if not longer, because you have to wait for things to dry, you have to wait for things to cure. So, Rosebad, how many dioramas? Very rough guess is okay. Do you make in a year? Uh, not as many as I want to. Depends on the size. I mean, I probably make three really big ones and a couple of small ones and then some miniature pieces and accessories and as well as random personal projects. It's about all I seem to have time for, but as this grows, I'll have more time to do more of all of it. And I'm trying to size down some of the stuff I do on the channel so I can do more stuff for you guys. But you see how, you know, this went pretty quick, but you add in the painting and the finishing and all the other stuff, you get a whole day's worth of work for a skilled, you know, a skilled trade, basically. It adds up pretty quick. And even at minimum wage, it's not really worth it for people. So if you're planning on doing these and making these and selling them like uh, I do some of, make sure you value your time appropriately and factor in paying taxes, buying supplies, paying for your overhead, all that needs to be factored into your rate or your price or your quote. So make sure you don't shortchange yourself. I did that at the beginning, just like most artists do. Don't do that to yourself. It also sets a precedent, precedent amongst people who don't want to make these that they can get them at way less than they're worth. Your time is worth your time. So make sure you are not shortchanging yourself. So for, thank you, Pat. Yes, thank you for the 44 thumbs up. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> but... What I wanted to talk about is the next step in this diorama. We're gonna add one more layer to this. And, oh, by the way, if you wanna see how to paint the actual concrete, I have linked below how to paint Hyper Real Miniature Concrete, which is a video I already did a long time ago. It's, I start in that video from where this is at. I start with the, the sculpted foam uh, that I think is black washed, and then I go ahead and I start painting it and showing you that technique. So, how to paint Hyper Real, Hyper Real Miniature Brick is linked in last week's video. How to paint Hyper Real Miniature Concrete is linked in this week's video. And The Street, you can go watch that. That was Art in Real Time episode 10. I go into more detail about how and why I do The Street the way I do it. I talk about painting techniques and finishing techniques and putting lines in it and all that stuff. I actually show you the painting as well in that video. So go check out that video if you want to see that separately if you don't already know how to approach that. But this is the last live stream I'm doing for 2023. All right, so give everybody time to watch episode 40 and episode 41. And episode 42, which is going to be the first Sunday in January of 2024, we're going to smash through this wall. 
we're going to do a breakaway. We're going to make it look like somebody's busted through the wall. We're going to do miniature busted brick, and we're going to crack the concrete even more, make it look like the Hulk or Juggernaut or some crazy character is smashed through the wall, or maybe even a piece of artillery has hit it and blown it up, all right? I haven't decided if we're going to be a smash through or an explosion or some combination of both, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this beautiful piece of art we made, and we're going to destroy it even more. I hope you guys liked watching Art in Real Time episode 41. And uh, there is, I think, over 30 episodes available um, of Art in Real Time in the members only section. Um, if you want to check those out, I think it's we're pushing almost 100 hours of members only content between the Workshop Builders tier and the Workshop Masters tier. The Workshop Masters have access to some more exclusive videos that are just for them. But the, um, the members, the workshop builders, have access to everything except those videos, which is most of the content over there. But my special thank you to the workshop masters is those exclusive videos that I try to do about every three or four months. I am a couple of months behind on one of those, but I'm going to be releasing one for them before the end of the year. And uh, hopefully a really cool one for them uh, at the end of the first quarter of 2024. I'm doing a super secret special project for somebody that I can't reveal, but the workshop masters will get to see that first. So thank you to all the channel members who were here. Thank you to all the people watching that came over from Instagram. I did a little Instagram promo today because I keep forgetting to do that. I got to let those people know that I'm over here. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for the five out of five stars. Thank you for the likes, guys. I appreciate it. I'm um, sorry if I missed any of your questions. Ask them in the comments later. Uh, go into the video and put it in the comments and I'll check it when I have time. I, I respond to all the comments. Um, sometimes they're re-responding back if somebody commented to my comment I miss because I don't get alerts for that and I unfortunately can't scroll through like I think I have like 476 videos or something on Instagram or on uh, YouTube um I can't go back through every video and check all those so I'm sorry if I miss those re-replies but try to ask everything can in the first question and I get an alert and I will answer that and I try to give priority to any channel member comments that are out there too so thank you guys thanks for everything and I will see you next year oh and Friday uh, if you're watching the future times it's already there but if you're watching right now or in the next couple of days Friday we have a special video dropping on the channel that the members got to see today so you guys are awesome thank you very much be kind to each other the world's a crazy place and uh, don't make it any crazier catch you later <laughs>